Imagine a world where every staircase has steps that are each five feet tall, where, <clears throat> where sports are played by individuals only in wheelchairs, where libraries are filled with books that are only written in Braille, and where the official language of your hometown or country is sign language. Imagine all of this. What thoughts and feelings come to mind? This is only a small glimpse of what it feels like to grow up and live in a world designed by people without disabilities for people without disabilities. Some of my earliest memories as a kid were from the playground, where I would sit and watch other kids run around, play on the playground equipment, swing on the swings, slide down the slides. And although I never verbalized it at the time, this was sort of my first uh, dose of reality, if you will, a realization moment for me that my life was different than everyone else's and probably always would be. But why was that? And more importantly, what could I do about it? As an only child growing up, I had a lot of time to sit and think. And I began to think that my disability was what made me different than everyone else, that there was something that was wrong with me that I could fix if I worked hard enough. And my family believed in this idea as well, um, that if I went to physical therapy every day, if I learned to use a walker, if I built up enough strength in my legs, that one day I could walk. So this is exactly what I tried to do. I went to therapy every day, and I did my exercises, albeit begrudgingly. Um, <laughs> I went through the pain and general unpleasantness of therapy sessions, because this is what I and everyone around me believed I needed to do in order to walk. And in my mind at the time, walking meant uh, normality and freedom. However, there was a problem with therapy that I distinctly remember. And that was every time I reached, you know, reached a goal or tried to reach a goal of whether that be like walking for short distances with crutches or learning to stand on my own for a few seconds unassisted, I would hit a setback, which was most often some sort of surgery where I would lose most or all of the progress that I had been working towards. As you can imagine, this can be incredibly frustrating and disheartening, especially as a young person. Fast forward five to seven years, I am now in middle school, getting ready to go into high school, and the continued frustrations I experienced with therapy, combined with the added academic stresses and rigor of high school, and the idea of needing to prepare for college beyond that, forced me to make a decision. Would I continue chasing a goal, uh, that was akin to constantly running into a brick wall? Or would I instead focus on academics and my potential future? Um, as such, I quit going to therapy and instead decided to focus on academics. And although it was never easy, I did quite well. In high school, my freshman year, I took a drafting class, which is essentially design via paper and pencil that is now mostly done on computers. Uh, that ultimately led me to an architectural design course in the 11th and 12th grades. It was during these years that I had an epiphany. If I could not change myself to fit into an environment built for those without disabilities, then perhaps I could change the world around me to fit what I and so many others with disabilities needed and still need today, which are environments that are free of barriers that so often stand in our way. This way of viewing the world, as I later learned, is known as the social model of disability and views disability as something that is created and either amplified or diminished by the world around us. I uh, began to view kind of this way of viewing the world as a path forward for me, as a way that I could achieve the equality, equity, and inclusion that I yearn for as a kid. This awakening in me sparked a passion in architecture and the built environment. I went on to study urban and environmental planning in college, which I viewed as a large scale architecture. The idea for me was not only to make buildings accessible, inclusive, and welcoming for all people, but to make the connections between them accessible as well, to make public transportation accessible, to make parks and other outdoor recreation opportunities accessible, inclusive, and welcoming for everyone with the ultimate goal of creating communities 
for everyone to live, work, play, and thrive. And thus far in my professional career, I have continued that pursuit. I currently work for a company who works with businesses, governments, and educational institutions to help identify and prioritize barrier removal while also providing suggestions for improvement. To give you a practical example of how the built environment impacts my own perception of my disability, I present my current living situation where I live fully independently. I have a parking space right outside my apartment. Uh, next to the parking space is a curb ramp that allows me to access the sidewalk easily. The sidewalk itself is relatively flat and leads to an apartment door that has no stairs or steps to access it. Next to my apartment door, I have installed a mailbox that allows me to check the mail more easily and conveniently than having to go up a half a mile hill to the other mailboxes. Um, my front door has a lower peephole in it, like right at about my eye level, uh, so that when someone knocks on the door, I can see who it is from a seated position in my wheelchair. Uh, once inside the apartment, all the doors and hallways are wide enough to accommodate my wheelchair. The cabinetry under the sinks in the kitchen and the bathroom have been removed so that I can more easily roll underneath of them. The controls for the oven and stove are on the front of the appliance so that I don't have to reach across you know, hot burners and potentially burn myself, which I've done several times. Um, and in addition, um, my washer and dryer are front loading, uh, which gives me the ability to do my laundry without having to stand up and reach down into the appliances to retrieve clothes. These are just a few examples of, of how the built environment impacts my perception of my disability. To top it all off, my car has been specially modified to give me the ability to drive and all the freedoms that come with that. <laughs> These features in the built environment combined with the associated technologies have allowed me to live a more fully independent life than I ever could have imagined as that seven-year-old kid on the playground watching all my friends and classmates participate in PE and recess when I could not. To sum, it all up, <clears throat> to sum it all up, when I'm in my own home or driving around in my car, both of which have been designed with inclusivity and accessibility in mind, my disability disappears. When we take this idea and expand it outward, hopefully you all can see that creating spaces and places for people of all abilities, backgrounds, and challenges creates a world where disability or not, it makes no difference. Where disability just becomes a different way of doing things, not an inability to do them. Thank you.